this topic of how to get published in academic journals has clearly drawn an a lot of interest from our global community. ICD is fortunate to have its own peer-reviewed open access scholarly journal focusing on research and innovation in open distance and flexible ed education named Open Praxis. And the aim of Open Praxis is to provide a platform for global collaboration and discussion. And since ICD is a global association, we welcome contributions from diverse regions and backgrounds. So for this session, we have the pleasure of inviting the Editor-in-Chief of Open Praxis, Professor Aras Boskort from Anadolu University in Turkey. He will now give you a presentation and then there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions towards the end of the session, which will be moderated by my colleague, Sophia. And since we have quite many participants here today, I encourage you to keep your microphones muted and to post your questions in the chat during the session, just to simplify the moderation. So without further ado, I will give the floor to our editor in chief. Please, Aras, the floor is yours. Um. Thank you. Let me share my screen. So I'm just checking now you see my screen and you hear me well, right? Perfect. Um, hello, everyone, again. Uh, thank you for your interest to that session. And welcome to GDC session entitled How to Get Pub Published in Academic Journals. During this presentation, I will share my experiences and uh, observation, but this doesn't mean that we will all be editor and reviewer proof researchers following this uh, presentation. Let me briefly introduce myself. I am an associate professor of distance education at Anadolu University, Turkey, and uh, I am also uh, editor in chief in Open Praxis. I am also associated with some other journals. I have um, multiple roles, but um, most importantly, I always tell that I am a learner and dreamer, and I believe that these roles are more important than the others, like being an editor uh, in, in a journal. Um, let's start with a spoiler alert. Uh, the secret to writing a good article is to be a good researcher, and for that, you need to read a lot and write a lot. As you read, your analytical skills improve and your writing skills sharpen. Um, but we have to remember that as well as your experience in the field, this is a skill you can sharpen. So uh, we should keep on reading and writing because after that process, the final version of your published uh, article uh, will be a wording and will uh, catch a lot of attention. Um, but often reading deeply and writing rigorously can be challenging and even painful, and this can uh, often uh, prevent us from writing a good paper, but we shouldn't give up. Uh, we should keep on reading and write, writing because, as I told you, this is the essential steps to, uh, to, to write a good article. Without reading and writing, uh, we... I think we cannot accomplish this uh, goal. My friend and editor-in-chief in distance education, Dr. Sam Laudu, wisely says, remember, you are joining a conversation, so make sure you have something unique to say. That's perhaps one of the most critical points that we should consider while writing scholarly papers. Your unique perspective will be one of the feathers of the wing that will carry you high in your career and uh, scholarly landscape. Based on my experiences, I can also tell that it is also critical to be sure that the final printed uh, product is something you will be proud in the future. So without any harsh, we should take our time distill every single detail and be patient. So how can we achieve this purpose? How can we write good articles? For this, we need to know the anatomy of an academic paper. For this purpose, we will briefly examine how the anatomy uh, of an 
of a paper works and how the parts of a paper, like the um, organs of a human body, have their own functions. Here we go. Let's see the anatomy of a scholarly paper. Let's start with the essence of this process by asking the question, what is the beginning of a, of a research? The purpose of a research is to solve a mystery, find an answer, and share this knowledge with other individuals all around the world. For this purpose, um, you need an aim and research questions. Indeed, an article is uh, part of several interrelated systems and um, the starting point of which is the purpose of the research and the research questions. In fact, the research questions determine your methodology data collection tools, data analysis process, how you structure the literature review and how you structure the discussion section. Uh, therefore, your purpose and research questions are utmost important and uh, your research cre uh, questions create a domino effect, uh, which identify your approach in other sections of the paper. Another point we should pay attention is meta section. This section, which is composed of the title, abstract, and keywords, is a micro representation of the paper and can be um, considered independently since most of the databases will present these uh, sections separately, independently. Please also note that if 1,000 people access your paper, 1,000 1, people will read your title, 500 people will read the abstract, perhaps 250 will read the keywords, and approximately 50 of them will read the entire paper. Thus, it is utmost importance uh, to forge these sections. Uh, I mean, title, abstract, and keywords. This means that uh, we need to invest more in structuring the title, abstract, and keywords which often go neglected. Um, let's keep on exploring the title of a paper. Love, scholarly love is when your heart skips a beat when you read the title. So we should write a title in a way, the, in a way that uh, let the editor, the reviewer, and the reader fall in love with your article. So make sure it is inclusive and a representative of the work, and please don't be boring. There should be a good expression once, because once it grabs the reader, uh, it should make them read to the end, uh, read all the paper. Uh, please also make sure that your title reflects the scope and nature of your study, and it should be relevant, informative, and able to arouse curiosity. So, don't waste words. Compose a song with around 12 or 16 words, uh, not much. Let the words you use in the title come together like the notes to form a composition. Not to be boring, refrain from using cliches in the title because cliche titles might um, shadow the true potential of your paper. Use a maximum of 12 or 16 words in the title, considering that most of the publications will appear online. Um, please also consider the perspective of search engine optimization and use a title that is easy to find, search, and visible in online spaces. Um, here, I'm showing you some article titles that are at least interesting to me. My question to you is, when you see these titles, do they make you want to read the articles? If yes, uh, you know what I mean. I mean, uh, you understand my intention. Rather than using cliche titles, uh, try to be creative and uh, try to uh, find a uh, good uh, title that captures the reader's attention. Um, when it comes to abstract, abstract gives readers a preview and informs them what comes next. 
if your article is the movie you are making, the abstract is kind of the trailer for that movie. So don't just call it an abstract. The abstract where readers look for answers to the questions like, what is in this article? Is this article worth reading? Is this article I'm looking for? So uh, the abstract should answer the why questions like the importance of your research, the how question like the uh, methodology and the what question like the uh, results results of your research. But um, do not overdo when writing an abstract. This will reduce confidence in you and uh, your future work. To, uh, to avoid some common mistakes, you can pay attention to the following issues. The abstract should be one single paragraph and should have a structured format. It should include an introductory sentence and should also address the aim, method, and significant findings and takeaways and conclusion of the study. Remember that in addition to the title, some readers only engage with the abstract and then decide whether to read the whole paper. Additionally, an abstract should be uh, around um, 200 or 250 words, which means that you must craft it carefully so that it uh, properly informs the readers and give your work the value it deserves. And please do not use in-text citations in the abstract since the abstract appears as a separate section in many uh, academic databases. Um, in some cases, a researcher uh, conducting a literature review decides whether or not to read the rest of the study based only on the abstract. And most of the time, researchers may cite the article by reading only the abstract without reading the whole article. That's why a good abstract should be a perfect mini copy of your article and represent your work. When it comes to keywords, keywords are the final elements of the meta section of an article. Um, the use of keywords, therefore, should be strategic. The keywords representing your work uh, that you will configure according to the search engine optimization will, will make your article more visible and listed in the top ranks in online environments such as Google Scholar. That means your keywords identify and uh, identify how, where, and when your study is seen in online spaces. Therefore, your keywords should be representative and distinctive. To um, identify appropriate keywords, ask yourself the following question. Which keywords should I use to find such a paper on the internet? Your answer will be really helpful uh, to find the best keywords for the article you write. Please also remember that keywords are also taken into, into consideration when assigning reviewers and therefore choose keywords wisely to avoid dealing with an irrelevant reviewers or you know, uh, second reviewers. You know, second reviewers are always problematic. Um, we can, I think we can explore the significant issues related to introduction and related literature section together. I will explain both sections uh, in the same slide. First of all, in this section, we should warm up the reader in the introduction section. You don't need to go so far back as to explain the uh, first emergence of the universe like the Big Bang Theory. This means that we should be clear in the introduction and only try to capture the reader's interest. After providing a background and informing readers uh, of the structure of the study, you can also write about the main purpose of the study with a general statement following the introduction section. This way, the reader will have a generic insight and an outline of why they are reading the rest of the study. And uh, this will be helpful, especially uh, while reading the uh, literature review section. And introduction section is also wide in terms of 
hooking the reader, capturing their interest. Therefore, uh, it should be uh, engaging and should motivate uh, readers to read the rest of the paper. In the introduction section, instead of cliche beginnings, use something interesting. For example, you can start by asking a question or question or presenting a thought-provoking argument, but using traditional beginnings such as a global pandemic in a globalized world throughout the human history will not, will not make a difference and uh, will not create a good impression. So in the uh, introduction and related literature section, we should be clear and precise. We should avoid cognitive load um, by getting rid of the unnecessary information. We should structure the literature review in the context of the research questions. In that way, it will be easier for the reader to make sense of your findings if you inform them with uh, related studies. In this section, you can report uh, similar related studies and discuss their common or uh, different uh, points. If possible, carry these studies you use in the literature review uh, section to the discuss discussion section. Lastly, it's important to set boundaries. Do not let readers get lost in uh, irrelevant references. Uh, while writing the literature review section, be focused, selective, and goal-oriented. You can uh, organize and report your literature review in a chronological, thematic, methodological, or theoretical manner, but never list studies in blocks. Instead of presenting blocks of studies, provide a summary, synthesis, and critical evaluation of the topic. Um, carefully select studies that contribute to the conceptualization and understanding of your study, provide a logical flow and connect the studies to each other, reveal research gaps and position your paper, um, report conflicting and supporting literature and finally locate your arguments based on the intellectual space you created when you formulated your literature review section. If applicable, you can provide a theoretical or, or conceptual framework. Indeed, that's really important. Using such a framework helps you um, contribute to a broader understanding of the topic, uh, build, on, build on an existing body of research, navigate among different assumptions, and provide researchers a basis for uh, future studies. But don't let uh, your theory hang in there. I mean, that means when you use a theoretical or conceptual framework, you also need to explain how it relates, relates to your research topic and report um, what your assumptions are. The most significant point is to bring this from a, a framework into a discussion section and interpret your findings through that lens. Um, we can pay attention to the following points while writing the purpose and research questions. State the purpose of the research at the end of the literature section and before the methodology section. Focus on the main idea when articulating the purpose of the research. Choose the action statement carefully. I mean, uh, testing effects, means, and quantitative experimental study. Likewise, ex exploring refers to a qualitative phenomenological study. So your action words matter. Um, in the aim of the study, emph emphasize if there is a theoretical or conceptual framework, uh, Please use unbiased language, provide information regarding the methodology. Um, here now you see some examples representing a well-structured aim of the study, uh, dealing, addressing many of the, many of the issues 
I've just mentioned about. Again, uh, please also remember that the choice of the research method will depend on the nature of the research question. Uh, at the beginning of the uh, this presentation, perhaps you will remember the beginning of everything is the research question. So uh, you should be really careful at that stage, be critical. And when you are sure about your uh, research questions, you should move forward. To know the method is to know the path. So may your paths always be clear. In the methodology section, you are actually presenting a map and a compass, providing a compass uh, to the editor, reviewers, and readers. Therefore, uh, therefore details matter in this section. Uh, you should give the editor, reviewer, and reader a roadmap so that they never get lost when they read the methodology section. Um, methodology section explains how you conducted your study, which um, methodology, methodological paradigm you adopted, and how it contributed to the uh, exploration and explanation of the research in question. This section should provide uh, details that may be needed to adopt or replicate the study. Please also remember that because methodology acts as a pillar of um, your research, a flaw in the methodological design can quickly undermine the overall research quality. It is therefore uh, utmost importance to double check your methodological uh, process before conducting your research. Again, I would like to highlight that the design and the flow of the method, 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 methodological design uh, section is already identified when the aim of the study was defined. Um, the following headings should be reported in the methodology section, and uh, I always suggest using subheadings to highlight uh, these sections. Research paradigm, research model or design, sample or study group, research context, data collection tools, uh, data analysis, wealth and reliability issues and limitations. Lastly, it is also good to remember some critical points. A large sample doesn't necessarily mean that study will be accepted or study is a really good study. Uh, and the limitations section is actually not the weak points of your study, but the limits within which the scope of your study is structured. That means the points you explain in the limitation section uh, will protect, protect you as a shield against reviewers and in some cases against editors. When it comes to uh, findings section, how you present the findings matter. In this section, you should ask the following questions. What kind of story do you have? How do you fictionalize it? And what kind of scenario do you create? The findings section is where you uh, answer these questions. Approaching from this perspective, you are supposed to report your findings systematically and in the same order if you have more than one research aim or research question. To report your findings, you can use figures and tables, but to avoid repetition and gain some space from the word count, do not provide the same data in the text that you provided in tables and figures. Uh, when you report your findings, do not manipulate the data and refrain from biased judgments and uh, interpretations that might uh, misdirect readers discussion section, perhaps, you know, this is the more important, uh, most important section in an article uh, because the discussion section is where the researchers demonstrate their mastery. This is where you often go get a rejection, even if there is nothing technically wrong with the study. In the discussion section, you are supposed to interpret your findings and report any new understanding or insights that emerged uh, from your research. 
one of the best strategies to compare and contrast your research findings from multiple angles by benefiting from the related literature. Uh, in this section, make sure that you take a critical stance without overinterpreting uh, the research findings. This section should be in line with the aims of the study and should be a link to the literature review and if applied, should use the theoretical or conceptual firmware uh, as a lens to interpret the findings. Um, you can highlight the significance of your paper and show that your paper fills a gap and contributes to the related literature, discusses the findings critically and pushes the readers to think critically. It is generally effective to uh, develop explanations based on the findings of the study, provide a deeper understanding by synthesizing the findings and formulating a critical discourse uh, based on the aims of the study. In simple terms, this is very report how your findings make sense and how you support the results by citing related lit literature. Note that what you argue should be subjective, robust, reliable, valid, yet not speculative. In most cases, editors uh, are concerned about the impact factor of a journal and they don't want to publish uh, generic repetitive works. Instead, they want to uh, publish work that provides a new perspective and uh, is like to, likely to be cited by other researchers. Here you can critically present a new perspective in the discussion section and uh, improve the chance of, uh, chance of your paper's acceptance. Findings and discussion uh, section can be given together or in some cases, as two separate headings following from uh, following each other. My preference is to add the discussion after presenting the findings. So uh, readers will first uh, will be introduced with the findings and following that the discussion uh, in uh, one section. The conclusions, implications, and suggestions section is where you provide a synopsis of your findings and report your conclusions. Um, it is also uh, the section where you demonstrate your contribution to the related literature by distilling solid conclusions based on your findings. Uh, in this section, we should uh, develop suggestions, but beyond the cliche, this would be good to do, make some solid suggestions based on your findings. Again, um, it is important to report the implications of the study and how it may affect the related stakeholders and what should be taken into, into consideration. Finally, um, providing suggestions is uh, also very helpful for future research direction. Your suggestions can be critical in terms of uh, setting a future research agenda and shaping the future research trends. In this regard, provide uh, solid and clear suggestions that indicate specific actions. Please also remember that conclusions, implications, and suggestions section is where the most people who are not uh, in academia may show an, an interest. I mean, most of the people uh, will read only these sections. The context of the suggestions can be theoretical, practical, methodological, or it can be um, directed towards uh, advanced researchers, institutions, decision makers, and policy makers. Or it can be structured in uh, macro, meso, and micro dimensions. Whatever strategy you choose, you should be careful uh, to be systematic in this part. What? What the when the article first comes to the journal, I frank I look at the format. I mean, does it follow the journal journal's temp template? Has care been taken, or was it sent with the thought of what if? 
In fact, uh, the uh, bibliography references and in-text citations are an indication how careful you are in terms of formatting and stylistic issues. So if you want to create a good impression, please uh, pay attention to uh, using uh, the right uh, style that the journal adopted. So in some cases, I see that people are rejected from a different journal and they sent the same uh, manuscript with other journals template. And uh, just uh, think like me, what, what would you think? Then you get the impression, okay, I'm the second, third or fourth good option. So you need to uh, adopt journal stylistic issues. That's, that's really important. And now some uh, bonus tips regarding publishing articles. Reviewers and reviewing. Reviewing is a good way of learning. Apply to be a reviewer or register yourself to the journals as a reviewer. You can, you can start creating a profile, for example, for open oh, praxis well, 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 well. after that presentation and select the reviewer role. The reviewer pointed to the review to review your paper doesn't have to be familiar with your topic. So it is your job to convince the reviewer. And after you receive a revision request for your manuscript, write detailed answers. Don't just say, okay, revised, done, or just don't put a tick. Write detailed answers and justifications. If you don't want to make a review recommendation, justify it with support from the related literature. Um, remember, <clears throat> second reviewers are exist, and when you submit your paper, do not forget uh, forget to say fingers crossed. In in some cases, you may be subject to meaningless, unfair comments by the second reviewer. That's normal. Deal with those reviewers, defend your arguments, convince them, and provide a sound rationale if you uh, do not choose to revise your paper as suggested by the second reviewer. Um, <clears throat> the article is your work of art, so you don't, you don't have to do everything the reviewers suggest. With good reviewers' uh, suggestions, your work can become a work of art, like the right section, or it can become a garbage. So while revising paper, uh, just uh, follow the suggest suggestions that uh, uh, fits best uh, for your purpose of the study. I mean, you don't need to do everything that reviewers suggest uh, for your paper. Um, when it comes to academic blindness, scholarly blindness, do not strive for perfection. Just write as the inspiration comes and when you come up with an innovative idea, just write it down. These ideas come all of a sudden, but likewise fly away uh, all of a sudden. So uh, do not uh, try to write something perfect. But also pay attention not to writing your article swiftly and sending it uh, immediately, uh, submitting it uh, immediately. Because you will experience academic blindness uh, while writing an article. Academic blindness means that the dots are connected in your cognitive world, but you might have failed to connect them on paper. As we work on a paper intensively, our brains can trick us into connecting these dots automatically. Therefore, it is a good strategy to leave the paper for a while and reset uh, our short-term memory so that our brains have a fresh beginning and then we can identify unconnected dots on our paper. That is, if you put your work in a drawer, wait for a while, and reread it after a few weeks with a refreshed mind, 
the uh, resulting product will be an improvement. You will see that. Reread and revise to reveal the artist in you. So uh, do not write and directly submit to it uh, a, a journal. Um, and editing can uh, address grammar, word choice, and structural, structural or uh, organizational issues. Printing and reading your uh, paper, reading it loud, and having someone who is not familiar with the topic uh, read it are the other effective strategies. After editing your paper, ask an academic body to read your paper and uh, give feedback and constructive criticism from an external perspective. Allowing someone else to critically review your paper is a good strategy to make it better. However, do not forget that there is no perfect final paper, but you can demonstrate a perfect effort. Um, Beware of the editorial bias in jump, some journals. So you can search by keyword from Web of Science or Scopus and choose the journals that publish the most on the top topic or uh, choose the journals uh, with the right scope. And um, uh, remember that some journals may prefer to publish articles only on certain topics or in certain uh, methodological paradigms. So pay attention to scope of the academic journals and uh, scope of the previously published articles. Uh, you know, such strategies prevent you from wasting time by submitting articles to the wrong journals. And I feel that open praxis uh, can be a right choice in many cases. So read the journal, uh, read the scope, and if you have a good article, submit it through. Um, some questions you can ask yourself uh, uh, sincerely while evaluating your work will guide you. Uh, these questions are as follows. How does, your, how does your article contribute to the field? What does it say differently from other studies? Does it fill a gap in the literature or answer a question that needs an answer? Does it make a real contribution to uh, related literature or is it just a repetition? And most importantly, does the study have a critical perspective? I think this is the most important question. And uh, as you remember, the discussion, discussion section is the uh, place where, where you can demonstrate your critical perspective. Again, as we are close to ending of this presentation, it is wise to remember that the fate of a submission is sealed long before it is submitted uh, for publication consideration to a journal, because this depends on so much on its building blocks and these blocks are identified by you. <clears throat> Finally, it's worth noting that every article eventually finds its home. So, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, we need to keep reading and writing. The more we read and write, the sharper our skills become. And at the end of the day, we can produce not just an article, but a, a, an a artwork uh, we created. Please also remember that an article is not just a printed piece of paper. It is your academic signature in the field. So we should always take care and work in such a way that we can be proud of the work we put our signature on. Therefore, when I write, I know that the final output is more than a scholarly paper and um, a contribution to the related literature. But it is also a part of my identity, the way I express uh, and reflect my ideas. And therefore, every word, expression, citation, and reference should be selected purposefully since they form an intellectual network and then becomes your 
personal or collective artwork? Yeah, happy ending. During the editorial process, you will have defeats and victories, but remain optimistic. Please keep your hopes high. And as I said earlier, always remember that every paper eventually finds its own. If you see the first statement in your email box, we regret to inform you, do not worry. But if you see the second statement, I am pleased to inform you that your manuscript is accepted for publication. You may scream, you deserve that. In a world where even Einstein, who is considered one of the smartest people in the world, was rejected, rejection of your paper is not the end of the world. Our motto should be, what doesn't kill you makes stronger. Yes, this is end of the presentation. I think it lasted around 40 minutes and yeah, it's good. Normally, you know, I do this presentation for an hour and it becomes boring after a while. Anyway, thank you for being here and listening to me. Uh, please feel free to communicate for further conversations. And now I will stop uh, sharing my screen and see if there is uh, any questions. Thank you very much, Aris. That was a really valuable session. And um, I'm Sophia, I'm from the ICD Secretariat and we have uh, many student members. And this topic is the most sought after topic. Everyone wants to know how to get published in academic journals. And, and as our editor of our journal, you're the best person to help us on this. So if there are any questions out there, please feel free to write them in the chat and then we will try to answer them within the remaining time. I'm so, also checking the, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we, we just got one right now, uh, which is from Mohammed. Could you please recommend a good and affordable journal? Well. <laughs> uh, let me think, open praxis. <laughs> yeah, and we'll put the link link to open praxis in the, in the chat now so everyone can access that. Yeah, open praxis, you know, is a good journal in many terms. It's first of all, it's an open access journal, and I know that being indexed with databases important uh, in some countries, it is uh, indexed by uh, Emerging Science Citation Index by Web of Science. Um, our uh, review and publishing process is relatively short. Uh, because we believe that, you know, in a knowledge intensive world, it would be not fair and wise to publish an article one or two years later. So I think you can start uh, uh, exploring open practice. Thanks everyone, by the way. And, and if I may, I, I also had a follow-up question, Aras, because you mentioned you encouraged uh, uh, everyone to become reviewers, to try to review other articles. So what does it take to be a reviewer? Do you have to be, have a PhD de degree already or, or is it an option for also PhD candidates? I mean, indeed, you know, some journals require a PhD degree, but uh, the real criteria is to be an expert uh, on that topic. So uh, you don't need to have a PhD degree. And uh, when we uh, receive the comments from the reviewers, we don't just send them to the uh, author. So they are being filtered. So if they are not appropriate, already they will stay in the system. But being reviewer is important in terms of uh, learning while reviewing. Because in many cases, criticizing other people or other works is easy. and while we are criti criticizing the uh, other papers, uh, we should also uh, learn from our criticism. I mean, I mean, we shouldn't do the same mistakes. So uh, eventually it will uh, improve uh, to outline a good paper. So please apply to be a reviewer.
Okay, I see we have another question. Do you have any tips to make writing efficient by the use of tech tools like AI? Um, okay. Let me screen. I will just uh, share something. As I told you, you know, open praxis can be a good option to uh, give that answer. You know, recently, most of the tutorials and papers are uh, about use of AI. And I think the problem is not using AI, but using AI ethically, uh, by applying academic integrity and adopting a, a transparent uh, policy. So our latest editorial actually uh, provides a lot of insights regarding these questions. So I, I just suggest reading the editorial. It is uh, available in the main page and uh, it is the latest editorial and I will also share the link just in case, but uh, the, the issue is that uh, many people use different AI tools and it seems that it is an inevitable uh, paradigm and it's, it's changing many things. So we can use them, but we have to use them in a proper way and we have to report how we used in our article. Uh, and as I told you, it's there are a lot of details, but uh, we provide a lot of insights in the in that article. Great, thank you. We have another question here. Firstly, thank you, Aris, for the stimulating presentation. How do you identify a research gap, and how big should the gap be? Um, you know, most of the people, editors, uh, require to address the research gap. But a research gap is indeed identified and conceptualized by the uh, authors themselves. Because uh, if we just uh, write papers to address the research gap, then we shouldn't write a lot of paper. So it is, yes, it's important, but it is also about the justification. I mean, the research gap cannot be really a big gap, but your justification, right? Uh, your approach, your critical perspective uh, can be equally important. So you don't need to find a real research gap or you don't need to uh, read many articles to identify a research gap. It's helpful, but it's not essential. Thank you. Uh, Andrew has a question. Are there any trainings for article review? Um, I think there are there are some services. Once I remember, there was a training by Pablo's, but now it's bought by Web of Science. I think they provide some guidelines, but I'm not sure uh, if they if they still provide a training. I mean, in a uh, structured way. Uh, but in in many cases, you know. Learning how to review is just jumping in the water. So uh, as you read the article, uh, as you approach them by adopting the role of a reviewer, uh, you will try to learn. So we have to practice. Hey, I think we have time for a couple more. Um, let's see. Should every article have quantitative quantitative data? Nope. The main assumption is that, uh, at least, you know, uh, in many countries, I, I see that people believe that uh, if they sample uh, includes many participants, it's a good paper, it, it can be accepted. It's a quantitative paper, it's a good one. Indeed, quantitative papers are the easiest papers to write because, you know, uh, you conduct an analysis and uh, 
you write your discussion based on the uh, significant difference. So it's easy. Qualitative papers, indeed, uh, more difficult. I mean, writing this kind of papers are difficult than um, qualitative papers. Uh, systematic reviews are uh, writing, you know, systematic review papers harder than quantitative and qualitative papers because the whole article uh, must somehow connect to each other. And the opinion papers or critical reflective papers to me uh, are the difficult, I mean, it's really, it really requires exper expertise to write papers because it's not ju just writing, uh, 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 writing your ideas, but uh, connecting them logically and uh, being critical is, is sometimes a loser, but it's not something easy. It really requires uh, experience. In the end, you don't, your papers don't need to be quantitative and uh, our policy as open practices, as long as the articles have a critical perspective, they can be uh, sent for review. And if they pass the review process, they can be published in our journal. Great, and that leads on to the next question of what types of articles does open practice accept? Are literature review articles accepted? Yeah, indeed, you know, we have two sections, research articles, that means you can submit qualitative, quantitative mixed papers or uh, systematic literature papers. Please remember that systematic literature uh, papers are still, I mean, research papers. But we have also have a section, innovative practice section. In this section, uh, we publish papers like opinion papers or uh, reflection papers. Uh, I mean, this kind of papers. I mean, in that section, you don't need to submit articles uh, adopting one of the prominent uh, research paradigms. By yeah. the way, yeah, there is another comment. I think this is recorded and probably will share with the participants, right? We have another question of how to find current trending topics for research. Can you suggest any web tools for this? Um, actually, you know, I just, I just build an intellectual network and I use social media like LinkedIn, Twitter. I follow the uh, prominent researchers, new researchers. So to identify trending topics, I, I mean, I just follow other people. And I also read global reports like OST reports or UNESCO reports, or uh, I really like uh, EDUCAUSE Horizon reports. I strongly suggest that reports. Uh, this will be helpful. I mean, there is no one strategy, but uh, you can combine these strategies together. Okay. Um, and then I'll read this question. I hope it makes sense when I say it, but it is, is it academically and intellectually acceptable to domesticate an article done or published elsewhere in one's area of study? That's like following the structure of another published paper as a guide from start to finish. Okay, if I correct, if I understand correctly, um, you can replicate a structure of another paper, but this doesn't mean replicating the ideas. Already, you know, as I presented, uh, there is a structure in academic papers. So yes, you can, follow structure of another paper, but you don't need to replicate the ideas. Just the structure, not the ideas. Hi, Frank. <laughs> yeah, we can take Frank's question as the last question, perhaps, as we have a couple of comments before the end. Um, so Frank is asking, in what way can open practice help address the issue of the underrepresentation of African authors in mainstream journals and databases? 
indeed, you know, open praxis as manifested in the name of the journal, uh, we are trying to be as inclusive as possible and uh, be voice of, you know, under represented areas, not only Africa, but Asia or um, South America. But the problem is we don't get a lot of submissions, you know, from these territories. We are trying to encourage them. We are, you know, recently we are using social, our social media uh, effectively so that we can uh, reach to these people, uh, draw their attention and uh, we can become voice of uh, others from these territories, but uh, indeed we are doing our best. You know, after uh, our current strategy and policy is all based on uh, an inclusive approach, but perhaps you can also help us by encouraging others from, let's say, uh, Africa to submit their papers to open praxis. So it's kind of even and a good collaboration. Okay, thank you so much, Aras. That this was a very useful session. Um, and your final point actually leads me on to my point, which is how you can get more involved uh, and learn more tips and advice for how to get published and other challenges along the way as PhD students and researchers and candidates. Uh, and that is to join the ICD GDC, the ICDE Global Doctoral Consortium. And I just want to share a couple of slides about this so you can get to know us a bit better. So hopefully it's up on the screens now. Yeah. Great, thanks. So the ICD GDC um, is um, a network that ICD has set up the last couple of years, and it's aimed at PhD and EDD uh, students, candidates and researchers within the field of open and distance education. And the aim of our, uh, this network is to obviously help build towards your future careers in the field, um, also find your um, peers to collaborate with on projects, and also to support the future leaders um, within the field. Um, and the best way to do that we have found is to connect with each other and to find each other. And what the GDC offers is a platform where you can find researchers within the field that are working on similar topics to you. Uh, so we have a database of uh, researchers that are within the GDC. And one of the things we do is we meet and we have events like these virtual events that are open to all currently, but we also have some closed events for GDC uh, members only. And we recently had an in-person event in our ICD World Conference in November last year. And we hope to do more of these going forward. So if you're interested and you think you fit the requirements that are on the screen, you basically need to be a current PhD EDD student or candidate in the field. Um, and then you need to become an ICD student member, which is free. You just have to pay a very small application fee for most of you. Um, and the way to find out more is to contact me. And there's my uh, email address on the screen, which is javid at icd.org. And we'll share that in the chat as well. And I just want to highlight our next upcoming event, which is on the 28th of February. And here we have one of the ICD GDC core partners, AU University, Asia E University, and they will be presenting on a on more of a, a topical um, topic, topical topic on <laughs> research methods. Um, so it'll be great to have you all there. It's an open event, and you can find that on our event page, which we'll also add to the chat. So thank you all for coming today, and we hope to see you at the next event. Yeah, they should definitely come to the next event and they <laughs> should definitely apply for Global Doctoral Consortium. Great, you heard it from Aras, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Aras. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.